Hello, everyone. Welcome to Read to a Child's Remote Read Aloud program. My name is Paul Lamoureux, and I'm the CEO of Read to a Child. Read to a Child is a national literacy and mentoring nonprofit that fosters a love of reading, improves literacy skills, and empowers underserved children by inspiring caring adults to read aloud to them regularly. Research shows that reading aloud to children is the single most important activity for eventual success in reading. In Read to a Child's flagship program, now called the Read Aloud Mentoring Program, an adult is partnered one-on-one -on -one with an elementary school student for a weekly read aloud experience. This special relationship typically lasts for the entire school year and often extends for multiple years through the end of fourth grade. Read to a Child's Read Aloud Mentoring Program utilizes nearly 2,000 corporate and community volunteers in the metropolitan areas of Boston, Detroit, Hartford, Los Angeles, and Miami. Joining us today are students and administrators from the Center for Success. The Center for Success provides enrichment, mentorship, and tutoring through free after-school programming focused on improving literacy proficiency for elementary students in Metro Detroit. On the call are Executive Director Andrea Meyer, as well as Director of Learning Heidi Miller and Director of the Detroit Program, Anna Rose Bear. Welcome, Center for Success. Thank you so much for having us. This is really exciting. Thank you, Jamia, for reading with us today. We're so excited to hear from your book. And Eunice and Natalie for helping get us uh, all hooked up here. We really, really appreciate it. This is exciting. Awesome. Thank you so much. Now it is my privilege to introduce our special guest reader, Jamia Wilson. Jamia Wilson is a feminist activist, writer, and speaker. As director of the Feminist Press at the City University of New York and the former VP of Programs at the Women's Media Center, Jamia has been a leading voice on women's rights issues for over a decade. Her work has appeared in numerous outlets, including the New York Times, The Today Show, CNN, L, BBC, Rookie, Refinery29, Glamour, Teen Vogue, and The Washington Post. Wow. She's the author of Young, Gifted, and Black, which we're going to hear some from today, the introduction and oral history in Together We Rise, behind the scenes at the protest heard around the world, Step Into Your Power, 23 Lessons on How to Live Your Best Life, ABCs of AOC, and she's the co-author of Roadmap for Revolutionaries, Resistance, Advocacy, and Activism for All. Welcome, Jamia. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for such a warm introduction. I'm so happy to see your faces. It's really great to see you all and to have the honor to read to you a little bit from one of my book babies, uh, Young, Gifted, and Black. So I like to tell people that I'm not lucky enough to have kids yet, but I do have books. And so that's kind of my, they're my uh, babies. and. I like creating books and the, those ideas are born from me and the, and the designers that I work with on them. And my very first children's book, Young, Gifted and Black, is this one right here. And it's always gonna be special to me because it is the first thing that I was able to cross off my bucket list that I wanted to do in my lifetime that I said when I was around your age that one day I would become a writer and that one of my books would be a children's book. And the thing that happened in my life is I did become a writer, but I also have done more than one book. I thought all I need is to do one. And after doing this book, I have done many more and I don't just write them now. I help other people bring their book ideas to life. So that is really exciting to me to share. And if there are other aspiring writers on this call, and I hope you are, know that the things you're dreaming about now will come true. And this book is actually um, my offering to you to show that dreams do come true. And the whole purpose of this book about Young, Gifted, and Black, about 52 Black heroes from the past to present, was really about the need for us to create the books that we need in the world. So when I was your age, I didn't see a lot of books that had people who looked like me in them. And if they did have people who looked like me, they didn't necessarily have stories that I could connect with all the time or stories that felt familiar to me. And so when this idea came about, I met a woman on the internet named Andrea Pippins. You can see her right here. And here's her portrait of herself and me, who is an American woman 
who is Afro-Brazilian American who lives in Sweden. And Sweden is in Scandinavia and Europe. And Andrea and I both were only children. And aside from wanting siblings in the world, which we both still do not have, we wanted to have books that reflected our community and reflected us. And we wrote the love letter that we had hoped had been written to ourselves and decided to make that come to reality. And now we are working on, um, now together we have three books. So born out of this book has been three books that we've done together out of that dream of wanting to create um, the books that we needed when we were your age. So the first thing I wanted to ask is, would you all, you can show me with the little reaction button, be okay with me reading about Mae Jameson, who is my favorite astronaut because we just celebrated the Mars launch. I met Mae when I was around your age at a conference in Indianapolis that my mom took me to. And I saw her at this conference and I made my mom flag her down so I could get Mae Jameson's autograph. And many years later, when I was an adult, just a few years ago, I went up to her and said, probably don't remember me. I was very intense about getting your autograph, but you are one of my heroes. And now I have you in my children's book. So I want to share, I want to share May's story with you. And I'm going to read to you from the story. And then I'll show you these beautiful graphics that Andrea wrote. So just imagine these as I read beautiful images that Andrea created and she hand drew all of them just for you to read. So Mae Jameson, like me, was born in October. She was born on October 17th, 1956. And she was born in a place called Decatur, Alabama in the United States. Has anyone heard of Alabama? You know where Alabama is? So astronaut, oh. you know where it is? You might have family there. So astronaut Dr. Macy Jameson was the very first African-American woman to travel to space. May set her sights on the stars early on. She was a curious child raised by a carpenter and a teacher in Alabama and in Chicago, not far from you. And when she wasn't hard at work studying, she was dancing, acting in plays and reading about science. May was fascinated by astronomy and the workings of the human body. Her childhood interest in science and in medicine led her to study biochemical engineering at Stanford University in California, and later to become a doctor for the Peace Corps in Sierra Leone and Liberia. And the Peace Corps, if you haven't heard of it yet, is a group of people who work in many different communities around the world, helping people to gain resources and it's Americans who go over and volunteer their time to help build communities. May said, I always knew that I would go to space. And she pursued this lifelong dream when she returned to the United States. She applied for NASA's astronaut training program and became the very first African-American woman in their space program in 1987, which to you probably feels like ancient times. But I was seven years old when that happened. In 1992, she soared to even higher heights as the first African-American woman to travel in space. So that is the story of Mae Jemison. You can see her in her space uniform here. There's Saturn drawn on her uniform. And I thought about her because of the landing this week and because I went out to look at the stars the other night and you could actually see Saturn shining really brightly um, from the park that I was in. So. Now, I want to read you one more before we open up to questions, but I want this to be a democracy. So tell me, would you like to hear about someone from Michigan? How many people would like to hear about someone from Michigan for the next, for the next one? Okay, I, I see a lot of hands. This famous person from Saginaw, Michigan, who was born on May 13th, 1950, was also my favorite person to write about in the book. But don't tell anybody else I wrote about in the book. And who might this person be? Stevie Wonder. So I'm a big fan of Stevie Wonder, and here's his beautiful spread. Obviously, Andrea and I are both big fans because he got a double spread. And as a publisher, I'll just say, that shows that he's a big deal. So Stevie Wonder is an award-winning musician, a former child prodigy 
and a pop culture legend. The third of six children, Steveland Judkins Hardaway Morris was born a preemie in Saginaw, Michigan. So if any of you were preemies, big expectations for you coming. As a result of being born early, he lost his ability to see. Aged 11, Steveland signed a contract with the hit-making Motown record company, which you may have heard of. Two years later, the boy, now known by his stage name, Little Stevie Wonder, topped the charts with his song, Fingertips. This was the first live recording to have this honor and the first single to lead the Billboard and R&B charts at that time. A prodigy, Stevie dazzled global audiences with his expert harmonica, piano, drums, and vocal skills. And as he came of age, his voice changed along with his body. This almost resulted in him being dropped from Motown, which caused him to abandon the little nickname and develop his identity as Stevie Wonder, the grown-up vocalist. In the absence of sight, Stevie uses his voice to share the hope he envisages for humanity. He said, just because a man lacks the use of his eyes doesn't mean he lacks vision. And as someone who was born blind in one of my eyes, just because a woman lacks the use of her eyes does not mean that she lacks vision. As one of the 60 best-selling artists worldwide, the 25-time Grammy Award winner uses his popularity to champion social causes. Due in part to his support, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday is now a national holiday in the United States. Did you know that about Stevie Wonder? He's done so much. And here is the beautiful spread that Andrea designed for him. Applause, everybody. Let's give Jamia a big round of applause. Yeah. There are 50 more stories that I'm looking forward to hearing from on that book. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, Do you want to ask me any questions about any of those heroes? Martha Luther died because people didn't like the way that he wanted it to be. It's true. I'm going to show you, since you mentioned Martin Luther King, here's an image of him giving his I have a dream speech, like he said, the way he wanted things to be, where he wanted there to be justice and equality for all people. And there are people who disagreed with him so much that they hurt him and his family. And that's why, Steve, that's why Stevie Wonder worked with Martin Luther King's family and his wife, Coretta Scott King, who honestly also deserves her own spread in this book. And if I do a second book, we'll have her own spread in it. Um, really fought hard to make sure that we have a national holiday so we can remember Dr. Martin Luther King, remember his legacy, remember his vision, remember his courage, and remember, most importantly, his message, which is about equality for all people and his dream for children to live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the context of their character. And you've probably heard him say that. Um, and so we're working still toward that dream. And uh, Martin Luther King's daughter, Bernice King, I think should also be in my next book because she's doing a lot of great work right now, helping to keep her father's memory alive. So thank you so much for mentioning him too. I'm really happy you brought him up, Jaya. Awesome, thank you, Jaya. And I see Avari's got his hand up both virtually and in person. How long did it take you to write this book and what made you to write this book? So this book took me about three months. The writing for me goes pretty quickly, but I had to find, first the hardest part was picking 52 people to feature in this book because there's so many people who deserve to be in this book. You know, many people, everybody deserves to have their story told in a book. And the theme of this book was about 52 heroes, past and present. And our challenge was to tell the story of 52 heroes with all of them having one quality in mind, which was to, you know, celebrate people of black history because that hasn't been celebrated enough, but we're working on that. But we also have an entire globe that we were needing to cover. So how do you find those 52 people from around the world, from every continent, and from every gender, people of, from disabilities, people from all different walks of life. How do we show as much diversity as we can while also knowing 
that we wanted to have it to be 52 so a family could focus on one hero a week to study and talk about at story time or a school could work on studying one person or featuring one person a week. So in the back of the book, we actually have uh, sort of like baseball cards, a hall of fame. So people can kind of look through the hall of fame and, and pick who they want to focus on. So that was the hardest part. That actually took me some of the longest to figure out who and, you know, going back and forth with my editors and the team to say, oh, well, I want this person and you want that person. And can we meet in the middle and do these people? Uh, for example, at first it was just going to be Beyonce, but I have interviewed and met Solange Knowles. I actually have never met Beyonce, but I know Solange. So for me, there was no way I was going to do this book without Beyonce and Solange, right? So mm -hmm. Having, making, figuring those things out and figuring out who would be in, et cetera. And uh, it was the same about the Williams sisters. I couldn't have one. I just had to have both. Um, and then writing the book and then coordinating between me, my editor, the designer, the illustrator, the production team that does everything to send the book to print. So that took, you know, more than that three months. That took, you know, six, seven months to get all that done. And then it got sent to the printer in China and then the book was distributed around the world. And, and the reason we did it was because there wasn't quite a book like this out on the market yet. There wasn't a book that featured international black history figures. So there's a lot of books out there more increasingly that talk about black history, but so many of them are just about Americans. And it's really important for us to talk about the world and talk about our global connections and the human family. And so in this book, we have people from every continent. And I say that because Matthew Henson, although he was from America, was the first black explorer to Antarctica. And since I couldn't feature Penguin in this book, <laughs> we count him as our representation of Antarctica um, because he did travel there, although there's not you know, humans that originated in, in Antarctica that we know of. You know, part of why we wrote this book, so this book, I have to think back because I've done so many books in the past few years. When this book first came out, um, I think it was right around, when I first did it, it was right around the time when we were talking a lot about the first wave of the Black Lives Matter movement and talking about what was happening in politics in this country. And that was a big reason why. And, you know, I, I don't have children yet, as I mentioned, but I plan to have children. And when I have children, they will be human beings who will have black skin, who deserve to have every opportunity as everyone else in this country. And that's part of why I wrote this book because I want my children one day to see themselves in a book, to recognize themselves in these stories and to say, even if we're hearing from people, even if they're people in power, if we're hearing things in the media that are mean things about people who look like us, it doesn't mean that they're true. It doesn't mean that that defines us. It doesn't mean if we hear bad things or stories people say about what people like us are supposed to be like, that doesn't mean that that's the full story. And it was very important for me to have that in the book to, so that children could say, okay, you're saying this thing about my community, but let me tell you about who we are. Let me tell you about Kofi Annan. Let me tell you about Langston Hughes. Let me tell you about Michelle Obama, Usain Bolt, Toni Morrison. Let me tell you about Kathy Freeman of Australia who is an Aboriginal Australian who ran with the Australian flag barefoot and then her own Aboriginal flag to say, yes, my people endured so much harm and endured so much pain as a result of simply being who we are. And I won this victory for us. And now I'm going to do a lap for my community to show that we are also great no matter what they say about us. So I want to thank you for your question and to say that part of how I speak truth to power is by writing books. And a big part of that is because, you know, I was born into a Southern family in the United States here where my ancestors not that long ago were forbidden from the right to read in slavery um, because reading and knowledge were considered that powerful. And so my writing, um, you know, there's been some people who have questions about children being able to have access to books that talk about tough topics. And I've had some people who have concerns about my books talking about things like racism or abuse or gender inequity. And I believe that children are the smartest people. Children actually understand and see a lot more than they're given credit for. I 
I have direct connection to my family who were born in slavery in South Carolina, and they sharecropped, and which meant farming. They sharecropped land in South Carolina and North Carolina, um, which I've now inherited some of that land. Um, and so I know who my ancestors are and from where they were and have done some research into knowing where they were stolen from and how they were brought to North America um, through slavery. And, from, and at that time, through my research around slavery for this book and otherwise, I learned you know, that there were slaves in the area that my family's from in the 1800s and in the 1700s and before that who were, would be tortured just for wanting to read just for wanting to expand their minds and to know more. And so that's part of why I read and where I write now, because I know how powerful reading is. Um, books have caused revolutions to happen around the world. Books have caused people to become awake when they were asleep. They've caused people to change their careers, to change their lives, to change the way they think about things. And um, that's why I do books and specifically children's books are my passion because I get letters from kids from around the world who tell me the most amazing things, but oftentimes just about how the stories in these books connect to their own lives and how they make them think about what they can do in the world, um, how they expand our minds. And so that's why I bring up the history of slavery because I write these books for my ancestors who weren't able to do what it is that they made possible for me to do um, through their sacrifices and, and, through, and through their vision and hope for a better future. Wow. Well, that's, a, I think, a perfect place for us to end. Um, you know, you've, you've really conveyed the power of reading, the power of your story, and opened up our awareness. Um, thank you so much for being here, Jamia. That was outstanding. I'm going to unmute everybody so we can give you a big round of applause and a big hoot and hollering. Let's Thanks. give her, yeah, let's give her. Thanks.